Mike Sempervivi here with you for the next hour talking about professional wrestling, which is something we do every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. Tune in iHeart, American Forces Radio, SportsByline.com, over-the-air affiliates like KMAV, 99 KMSR, and the mightier 1090. Maybe you're listening on podcast or replay on Sirius XM, or maybe you're video streaming on Twitch or YouTube. However, you're joining me today. I'd just like to say thank you. Hopefully, wherever you are, it's sunny outside, and if not, hopefully it's sunny inside your mind. A dreary, cold day here on Delmarva. I guess it's not really even all that cold, but it's been... A lot colder recently, and it was warmer this morning, and the temperature has dropped, and it feels like it's going to snow, and I'm not ready for snow. No snow is going to be planned or called for, but still, that's what it feels like, and I know that's where we're headed, but I'm, I'm here to keep you warm, at least, when it comes to the wrestling end of things, and there's a lot to get into because... It's a day that ends in Y, and there's always something going on in the world of professional wrestling. WWE SmackDown is tonight from Columbus, Ohio, and it's our first big show, our first big fallout for the SmackDown brand after last weekend's Crown Jewel show. Also tonight is AEW Rampage from Oakland, where they'll also be taping tomorrow's Collision show. So for those of you who like to avoid spoilers, uh, just uh, be aware that uh, Collision is going to be a tape show. Everything for them is leading towards next weekend's Full Gear pay-per-view at the Forum in Los Angeles. We'll see what they have planned for tonight and the weekend, as well as next weekend's Full Gear. It's Veterans Day here in the United States of America, a day to honor the military, those who serve, and especially those who have lost their lives in combat. And in a press release today, WWE has announced that in honor of Veterans Day and on behalf of all Americans, the company is raising one of the largest American flags in the country on top of the WWE headquarters in Stamford, Connecticut. 3,040 square feet of flag, 76 by 40. The press release says it will fly as a beacon of patriotism. That's a big flag. We got some Vince McMahon news, too, as he hides behind that flag. He's selling stock. We'll get into everything when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. Welcome back to the show. Mike Sempervivi here with you. We do this show right here for an hour at a time every single day. But if you want us 24-7, you can find us on Twitter or X or whatever you'd like to call it. I am at Sempervivi. You can follow Filthy Tom Lawler, who is not here, at Filthy Tom Lawler. We'll be getting to that later. And at Sports Byline USA. Oh, at Brian Alvarez as well, too. We'll get to him in a moment as well. Make the wrestling news part of your day, though. Everything you need to know to get your day started, get you up to date, or get you to your favorite wrestling review pod like Wrestling Observer Radio with Dave and Brian. It is daily free and between 5 and 15 minutes long. No clickbait, no speculation, no rumors, no paywall, just the wrestling news. For more information, head on over to thewrestlingnews.com and at Wrestling News AV on Facebook and Twitter. Big Boss Man is not here. He is matriculating again, I believe, at his child's school. Actually, wait a second. It's Veterans Day. The kids are off today. Where's Brian? I don't know. But hopefully he's enjoying his time. I know Filthy Tom Lawler is going to be enjoying his time tonight. He is in Dallas, Texas right now, getting ready for his fight against his longtime NJPW strong rival Fred Rosser. We'll be getting to that card taking place at the Curtis Caldwell Center down there in Texas a little bit later on in the show. Still thinking about that flag, I got to be honest with you. 76 feet wide, 40 feet tall, 3,040 square feet of patriotism just flying above the the, uh, WWE headquarters in Stamford. The average cost for a home in Washington, D.C. is at least $300 a square foot. At least $300 a square foot. That flag, if it was a house, would be worth about $912,000. A million dollars in patriotism just flying above WWE headquarters. And Vince McMahon in the news. Um... Doesn't have anything to do with inside the ring, really, but everything to do with the corporate side of things. 
Vince intends to sell off approximately one-third of his stock in TKO, the company composed of WWE and UFC. That is according to an official press release yesterday. McMahon plans to sell 8.4 million shares of TKO stock, which is currently valued, or at least was as of yesterday, at $713 million. McMahon would receive all proceeds from the sale with Endeavor Group, TKO's parent company purchasing $100 million of McMahon stock. Endeavor CEO Ari Emanuel has also indicated his interest in buying $1 million worth of McMahon stock, while other unnamed company directors are also interested in purchasing $850,000 worth. The 8.4 million shares that McMahon would be selling off make up nearly one-third of the 28.84 million shares McMahon currently owns and would reduce his ownership stake in the company from 16.4% to 11.6%. The stock closed on Thursday at $84.90. It fell in the after-hours trading and opened this morning at $76.87. In a September regulatory filing with the FCC, TKO announced that all of McMahon's stock would be available for a buyback and he would not be tied to the same restrictions that other large company shareholders would be held to. At the time that occurred, Axios reported that McMahon, having the ability to sell his, st to sell his stock, quote, seems to be give about giving McMahon flexibility or maybe even TKO flexibility given the, given the ongoing investigation, end quote. As you may remember, there was a raid on uh, Vince and WWE again with still the FCC investigating and I guess the Southern District of New York still investigating or the SEC, I believe it said the FCC, but the SEC and the Southern District of New York looking into payoffs that McMahon had made and, and in relation to all that stuff. Uh, the filing said that McMahon, as well, as well as two other TKO executives, will be selling stockholders in this offering, meaning that they had planned to sell their stock at the time of the deal. This morning, David Faber on CNBC said that apparently, in quotes, it was about estate planning for McMahon, who is 78 years old. In this week's Wrestling Observer Newsletter, Dave notes that McMahon has to maintain 7 million shares to keep his position as chairman of the board of directors. And even when the sale goes through at over 20 million shares, he is comfortably above that threshold. I think everything could be true when it comes to the sell-off of the stock and how it was filed in the first place with the ability for McMahon to sell back the stock. He facilitated the sale. He was very important in that. He jammed his way back into the company to be a part of the sale, and he is reaping the benefits of the sale. And again, the amount of money that he made off of that deal, the you know $713 million uh, that that stock was valued at, you know that's a big windfall for him. He just got a big windfall in a one-time payout to WWE uh, shareholders. Uh, he got a big you know check from that. So he's old. He's 78 years old, you know, no, no, no doubt about it. He is still married. To, to Linda McMahon, whether they have a super tight relationship or not, I have no idea. But, you know, in their aging years here, what can you do with all of that money? What are you going to do with this stock? How much are you even going to be involved in? It certainly seemed like this was all set up. So, yeah, Vince could cash out. But also, in case something did go sideways with all of the investigations and all the heat that Vince has had on him, they put in some checks and balances there that made it uh, obvious that they could buy that stock back if needed. And, and that's all of the stock in case something else actually happens here, which I don't foresee. You know, that story has been quiet. I guess if the government is working on something and they're quiet, we'll hear about it when they actually do something about it. But all of the talk about Vince and the L.A. Times article that came out uh, about a little, little over a month ago now and, and all that just seems to all kind of have gone by the wayside. So we'll see how it goes. But Vince McMahon selling off a, a large amount of stock and, again, reaping a whole lot of benefits from it.
When it comes to inside the ring, WWE SmackDown will be at the Nationwide Center in Columbus, Ohio tonight. They have not announced a whole lot, but there is going to be fallout from last weekend's Crown Jewel pay-per-view in Saudi Arabia, where Roman Reigns defeated LA Knight to hold on to the WWE Undisputed Universal Championship. LA Knight has a match against Grayson Waller tonight, which... I would assume he gets back on the horse with a big victory there. I don't think they're quite done with L.A. Knight yet. Carlito against Bobby Lashley, which furthers the storyline between the Street Profits and Bobby Lashley and possibly B-Fab. We saw B-Fab pull Bobby Lashley away, so getting a woman into the mix to go square off against uh, Zelina, I would assume, uh, from the LWO. So Carlito and Bobby Lashley is tonight. And on the undercard, or I'm sorry, on the dark side of things, the dark matches that have been announced for tonight are Cody Rhodes against Damian Priest and Jay Uso against Gunther. So we'll, we'll definitely know that those guys are all going to be there, and we'll see how everything plays out for them on the show. WWE also has house shows planned for this weekend. Saturday, there's an event in Johnson City, Tennessee, and then they'll go about three hours north up I-81 into Roanoke, Virginia for a show on Sunday. NXT also has at least one house show planned for this weekend. It's going to be tonight in Lakeland, Florida. I'm not sure if they have anything else kind of set up there, but there has been talk about, you know, can NXT run more live shows? Can they run bigger buildings when they end up debuting in October of 2024 on the CW? And I think it would be very simple to do that. I think it would be quite easy to do that. And Again, you have a lot of buildings in Florida, in Georgia, and in that general area where, again, you could run those shows on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, if you so chose, and then fly who you needed to, to on Tuesday to wherever it is that you're going. And, you know, to be honest, the more house shows that NXT folks have a chance to do, the better, because it's needed. Look, Lyra Valkyria, and there's a lot of other people on there that, you know, they're on the cusp of being players on NXT, but they need character development work. They need to be more comfortable inside the ring. And again, there's plenty of people that fit that mold, including all of those NIL folks that they bring in all the time. They got to get some work somewhere. And that way, when it comes to CW, hopefully at some point you won't have to rely so much on the main roster. We'll be back, Wrestling Observer Live. Back on the show, Mike Sempervivi here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. No Brian Alvarez today. He will be back with me on Monday on this show. If you can't wait for that, and hey, I can understand why, why you couldn't. You need the boss man in your life. Don't worry, he and Dave will be doing a show Sunday into Monday. Wrestling Observer Radio, only for subscribers of the site. And, of course, the Brian and Vinny show will be up on Sunday as well. I uh, safely assume that Dave and Garrett Gonzalez, uh, right about now or, or in, a, in a few minutes here at least, will probably be putting together a brand new Wrestling Observer Radio that will be up on the site for everybody. If you need some alternate listening of Brian Alvarez, you can do that on my friend Brian Solomon's podcast, Shut Up and Wrestle, where Brian was a guest. And it is a very interesting conversation between two gentlemen about the same age who were involved in the wrestling media business at the same time on opposite sides of the fence, very distinct opposite sides of the fence. Brian Solomon working as an editor at WWE Magazine and, of course, Brian Alvarez and the figure four newsletter that he was producing at the time. And there are some very funny stories back and forth about uh, <laughs> the Observer being seen in WWE offices and some really great talk about wrestling uh, and how both of them view it. So you can check out that podcast wherever you get your favorite podcast. It is a free one. Shut up and wrestle with Brian Solomon. Back into the news here. Of course, AEW tonight, Rampage at the Oakland Center in Oakland, California. FTR against Ejo Del Vikingo and Commander is the only announced match so far. I have not been on social media. I will not be on social media during this show, so they may have announced more announcements for tonight, but uh, I don't have them here in front of me. Just that one match for right now. They'll also be taping Collision for Saturday night on TNT tonight. It's uh, the first time, I believe, that the show has been pre-taped. La Faction and Gobernables, Dralistico and Roosh against the Workhorsemen, Anthony Henry and J.D. 
Randy Drake. And there's also going to be a six-man tag team match. Adam Copeland, Darby Allen, and Sting against Lance Archer and The Righteous with Jake Roberts. At some point, spin the wheel, make the deal is going to be said, I am sure, while those people are mixing it up. All of this leading into AEW Full Gear next Saturday at the Kia Forum in Inglewood. I had to kind of see, I wasn't sure exactly how much competition that AEW would be facing from football this week. Obviously no NXT, no WWE to get in the way this week. Oklahoma and West Virginia, eh, a lot of, a lot of the uh, eyeballs will be off that game. Uh, that's coming up 7 o'clock on Fox uh, with Oklahoma's loss last week. It loses some of its luster. The number one team in the country, technically, when it comes to the bowl playoff standings, Ohio State number one against Michigan State. That's on NBC and Peacock at 7.30. Number seven, Texas against TCU on ABC. And that really looks to be about it when it comes to competition for them. So, again, you know, uh, how much will it matter uh, that the show is pre-taped? I don't think all that much. I don't believe all that much. I think, you know, if they're going to do 450,000 people, they're going to do 450,000 people. If they're going to do 700, they're going to do 700. It doesn't matter. I think if football is there or not, the people that are going to watch football, that's what they're watching. But WWE events obviously playing havoc on them. So we'll see how it goes. I'm not sure exactly how collision, if they're, that's going to be zero hour next week or whatever. I'm sure we'll be talking about that as the uh, the week goes on here. MJF going to bookend the show, facing off against Jay White for the AEW World Championship in the main event. He begins the show by teaming up with someone, someone to face Austin and Colton Gunn for the ROH World Tag Team Championship. Maybe Roderick Strong raises up from the wheelchair he's in. Doesn't seem to me like MJF would be too keen on having Samoa Joe as a partner, considering the way that everything went off the air last week with Joe laughing at the fact that his friends keep falling one by one. So we'll see exactly how all that plays out. Hikaru Shida against timeless Tony Storm. Mariah May has got to play a part in this. I didn't really get a chance to say anything about this because, you know, again, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, But Mariah May's debut was not stellar, but they got her out there for one week, said this is who she is, and this is what she's here for. This is Mariah May from Japan. She's coming over here, and she wants to meet Tony Storm. And obviously that is going to play right into uh, surely a storyline where you know, Tony Storm has got her minion there, and, and, and Mariah May has got her 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 secondary banana. What are they called? The understudy on stage. She will be the understudy for Timeless Tony Storm, and she will go through all the rigmarole, and I'm sure probably help Tony Storm win the title from Hikaru Shida, and then leading on to a story that deals with Tony Storm and Mariah May, and they could use that. They need a women's storyline that people can be entertained by and kind of sink their teeth into. And with Tony Storm being a part of that, outside of Jamie Hayter, she's the best chance you got. And since we don't know when Jamie Hayter's coming back, come on, Tony, please make something out of this with Mariah May. You need stars there. It's one of the reasons that Julia coming over to AEW would be a much bigger deal than her going to WWE. Be a much bigger deal for AEW, surely, because... They just don't have the talent level, and they just don't have the stars. And I don't know if there's anybody else you can pull off the street and bring into AEW and have them make as much of a significant impact as Julia could right off the bat. Being able to help with, with again, look, look at Mariah May and what she was able to accomplish in stardom. For those of you who watch stardom, and you watch her at the beginning of her run to the end of her run and how much improvement she made... I mean, it was huge. Now, will that be able to translate going into AEW? We'll see. We'll see how many flaws of hers get exposed. You know, being with Mina Shirakawa and being in the positions that she was in, she was always put in there in in a position to shine to a fan base that was watching that specific product to see them. Now you have a more general wrestling audience with AEW. We'll see how they take to her inside of the ring. But as long as the entertainment aspect 
is kept, you know, not serious, but is focused on seriously, even the ridiculous stuff. You know, I have a feeling Mariah May is going to get certainly over with, with Tony Storm. Hopefully Jamie Hayter can come back soon. Jamie Hayter and Britt Baker, that's still a story that's going to have to play itself out down the line. Chris Statlander cannot get hurt anymore. We've got to see exactly how big of a star Chris Statlander can be. Obviously, she's got her fans in AEW, but they really need her to, to stay in there. Hikaru Shida's great. Hikaru is going to be the glue there for a long, long time, but she's not an impact maker and unfortunately they don't have a lot of impact makers there when it comes to the women again not to say she can't be a bigger star than she is but she's not going to be as big of a star as julia if she julia were to come in and be presented in a great way and it's just another person you can have having great matches with those other women and again there's so many women on the on the roster when it comes to WWE, your Rhea Ripley's, your Bailey's. Dakota Kai's been hurt, but when she comes back, she's good. Charlotte Flair, uh, Bianca, again, they're Becky. They're loaded up with women. You know she can have great matches up there. Kyrie Sane coming back. EO Sky's up there. You don't have that type of depth, and you don't have that ability to make matchups in AEW, so... Again, the Mariah May situation is going to be key for them, but it's going to be even more key if they can draw Julia in. Sting Darby Allen and Adam Copeland with Ric Flair against Christian Luchasaurus and Nick Wayne. We'll see how it goes. I'm not uh, I'm not being fair to Flair. I don't want to see him involved in this mix. Obviously, he's going to be involved in this mix. Be interesting to see where they go and what they decide to do in that match. The easy answer is Nick Wayne takes the loss. Orange Cassidy against John Moxley. Singles match, AEW International Championship. I would assume Orange Cassidy gets the victory here. John Moxley does not need a belt going into the Tokyo Dome show, uh, which is going to be his next big event after this one. Hangman Adam Page and Swerve Strickland in a wrestling match. We better have a stipulation attached onto this thing uh, by Wednesday night. Golden Jets, Kenny Omega and Chris Jericho against the Young Bucks is the other match on the show. If the Golden Jets win, they will get the Young Bucks AEW World Tag Team Championship opportunity that I think most people have forgotten about. And if the Young Bucks win, the Golden Jets must disband as a team. I think the Young Bucks win, the Golden Jets disband as a team. <laughs> And, and we'll see where we go from there. I don't know. We'll see how it goes after this week. Uh, I'll have more thoughts on it and, and think about it a little bit further to, to see what happens there. But that's it in the world of AEW right now for the most part. Impact is running a show tonight. Impact Wrestling Throwdown or Throwback Throwdown 4 IPWF taking place. That's going to be on Saturday, I'm sorry, from the Battle Arts Academy in Mississauga, Ontario. The show is going to be streamed on Impact Plus. I didn't get a chance to see Impact last night, but I believe this is the show where they, they go back and they, they do it 80s style. It's like a Johnny Swinger uh, deal for the entire time. Just a fun, goofy show that they have on there. It's going to be on Impact Plus. And, of course, New Japan Pro Wrestling, which we'll get into after the break. Lone Star Shootout tonight at the Curtis Colwell Center in Garland, Texas. Five of New Japan's 12 championships will be defended on that show they have too many title belts in New Japan. There are too many title belts everywhere. I never thought I'd ever say that as a young wrestling fan back in the day who was sitting there watching the national title and the mid-Atlantic title and all that sort of stuff. I have learned my lesson. I'm sorry. Take the belts away. We'll be back. Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi here with you. Wrestling Observer Live on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. I forgot for the ASMR kids out there. It's a little late in the show to be cracking this thing open, but here we go. That was for you, Winter Red Bull. Uh, I'll probably have half of it and then pour it out. Um, I've been a lot of water today. I think I'm going to stick with that. Too much caffeine. Not good for you, especially if you're getting in the form of those woo drinks. I heard some of the ingredients that were in there. I don't know about making that the uh, official drink of AEW, but uh, there's other drama in AEW. I thought this story was out there, and I guess in in a small wrestling bubble it was, but uh, it made its way to the main page of the Wrestling Observer website today. 
Dave wrote about Metallic refusing to do a job to Commander on the October 20th Rampage show. He wrote in this week's newsletter, quote, The reason the October 20th Rampage show had only three matches instead of four is because Commander against Metallic was booked for the show and then pulled when Metallic refused to put Commander over, end quote. Dave Meltzer wrote in the newsletter, Metallic still worked collision a few days later, but that can't help have helped his standing here. Uh, Dave also wrote, Metallic had just lost a commander in a singles match taped for ROH TV on October 14th. The match aired on October 19th. He also wrestled the October 21st ROH taping, losing to Angelico. Metallic was then back on the October 28th ROH taping and wrestled in a four-way with Angelico, Slim J, and Gringo Loco. Last week, Metallic was in Tijuana for a show with the Crash promotion on November 3rd. As for Commander, his availability for AAA TV tapings on Saturdays is now in doubt as AEW wants him to work their weekend shows. Quote, AEW pretty much said they wanted Commander every Saturday and that leaves it being difficult to book since AAA's TVs are often on Saturdays. End quote. That came from Dave. On September 5th, Metallic had announced on his Twitter he would not be working anymore for CMLL as they could not come to terms on a deal. He had returned to CMLL in June when the company made the decision to make Pantorita del Ring the new Mascara Dorada or Mascara Dorada 2.0. They have since dropped the 2.0 uh, from uh, the new Dorada, and so that's the only name he's going with. That's it. Metallic is Grand Metallic, but I don't know what kind of options he has. I know that that crash promotion still runs occasionally, and I assume that the checks don't bounce on those guys, but seems to not be somebody that CMLL has any interest in. And let's be honest here, for those people that have watched him for a long time, He's not the same guy that he was. Age has caught up to him. He was in WWE for a long time working that style. And I don't know if he has overestimated his worth or not. But again, shooting down that loss to Commander, I get it. But obviously, from what Dave is writing, they are serious about Commander and that's something metallic. It's a world he's got to be living in. So I don't know what his relationship is with AAA. I don't know if he can go travel elsewhere, go to Japan, or do something else. But he's going to be putting himself in a pretty bad spot here uh, if this continues on. Lance NOI says missing out on opportunities such as appearing on WWE programming with his family played a role in asking for his release from MLW. This was posted up to the main page by Ian Carey this afternoon. NOI told Steve Fall of WrestlingNews.co recently that he was unable to take part in a tribal court segment on WWE TV and an A&E special due to his MLW deal. He also says MLW hadn't offered him any any dates after he returned from a tour with Noah. He says, quote, I was in Japan. I told him when I was getting back from Japan, they had no dates for me. They had nothing for me, end quote, he said. However, not being able to appear on WWE programming also factored, in, factored into his decision. Uh, he says he just wants freedom for right now. Quote, I missed a few opportunities being with MLW, that one on a and &E. I missed the possibility of being on the tribal court they were doing, bringing in the family. I missed that opportunity, and now I can do it all. I can be at extra work. I can be at tryouts. Nothing is stopping me now, so I'm just ready to go. Hard for me to believe that you will not be seeing at some point or another Lance NOI, Jacob Fatu, possibly Juicy Finale, who also received his release, brought in as members of the bloodline or associated with the bloodline. It's very difficult for me to believe that, considering that the right now there's no end in sight for Roman. Even if he loses the title of Cody, then you have all the after effects of that that continue to play out. You still have issues with Jimmy and Jay and Solo on the rise and all that sort of stuff. There is still a lot you can do, you know, in, in the bloodline and in with the Samoans if you so chose. So 
seems to only make sense that they do that. You know, there were hopes for a lot of people that Tamatanga and Tangaloa and Hikaleo could come in at some point. That obviously not happening, uh, but as times have changed, you know, who knows what we see in the, the next months and years, you know, as we go along here, because I assume they're tied up now uh, for at least two years with New Japan Pro Wrestling, if not longer. No surprise that MLW would not let them appear <laughs> and not let him appear on a WWE program. He can't. You got an antitrust lawsuit that MLW had filed in January of 2022. There would be no way they would have let him on there. You can make a case for the A&E stuff, you know, that it's, you know, being filmed, it's a documentary or whatever. But the thing is, it would still be MLW allowing his guys under contract to participate in a WWE sponsored event and you're suing them for keeping you off of reels and interfering into your contract deals and trying to get television. So no shot that was going to happen. But where I do have a lot more sympathy is the fact that he's not getting booked. And this is something that Alexander Hammerstone has brought up. It's something that a lot of people have brought up with MLW because of not running shows and running them infrequently and this and that. You know, if you're not booking someone, let them go work elsewhere. I think that was the issue with Mance Warner way back was, you know, hey, look, you know, I, I have an opportunity here to go do these things and go make this money and appear here. And he was not able to do that. There was a little bit of, I guess, a embarrassing situation for Aries this week. The luchador Aries who came out and asked for his release from MLW says he wasn't getting booked moving forward. You know, he signed a deal that wasn't in Spanish and, and that was never translated for him. And I want my release. And that was followed up not long later, like I, I, minutes probably, maybe, maybe it was a couple hours with Cor Bauer and MLW saying, Hey, we gave you your release a couple months ago, but uh, apparently Conan didn't tell you about it or no one at AAA told you about it. So that was a little bit of an embarrassing situation there uh, when it came to Aries. But some people have been released from their contracts. Some people have an Alexander Hammerstone, again, being the biggest name that has not been released. He is now working, going to be doing uh, GCW. I, I see he's he's going to be there and I'm sure he's going to be getting picked up in a couple other places as well, too. Would not surprise me if we see him on NJPW Strong Shows. I think it would make sense to see him on NJPW Strong Shows. Wouldn't be the worst idea in the world, I don't think. I'd rather have Filthy Tom Lawler there all the time, on top, where he belongs and deserves to be. Former NJPW Strong Openweight Champion, lost that title to Fred Rosser. Still feuding right now. It is going to be on the free pre-show Saturday. That match between those two and Matt Vandergriff against Barrett Brown. That is going to be the kickoff at the Colwall Center in Garland, Texas. In greater, uh, greater Dallas there. Never open weight title. Shingo Takagi against Trent Beretta is going to be the main event. First defense of Shingo's third reign as champion. Hard to believe that Shingo won't hold on to the belt there. IWGP Women's Championship. Mayu Iwatani against Stephanie Vacare. Second title defense since winning it in April against Mercedes Monet. Uh, she beat Utami Hayashishta in August. New Japan World Television title, Zack Sabre Jr. against Speedball Mike Bailey. 16th defense for Zack Sabre Jr. The storyline for New Japan is he has said he would reach 20 defenses by the end of the year. We'll see if he can do so. I don't think in any of those matches there is any shot in hell of titles changing hands. I don't believe that there's a case that's going to be the case, uh, or I believe that's going to be the same way in Eddie Kingston and Satoshi Kojima. I love Satoshi Kojima already treating, uh, tweeting about bread products in America this morning, said he wanted to have donuts, but instead he had a bagel because they're healthier. And then he decided you could have a hundred bagels. So he may be a little bit, uh, uh, you know, lagged down by <laughs> tomorrow night. But he and Kingston, it's Kingston's seventh defense since winning it in July from Kenta. The strong open weight tag team title. 
The reason I don't think you could see a title change here, even though it wouldn't hurt my feelings, if the West Coast Wrecking Crew and members of Team Filthy, Jarrell Nelson and Royce Isaacs, you know, they could win the title and defend the belts here and on their indie dates and all that stuff. But one, you just put the belts on El Fantasmo and Hikaleo, and you still want to establish and keep Gorillas at Destiny, uh, you know, kind of reestablish them again, kind of get them strong and get them going again. And the other reason why is the West Coast Wrecking Crew, I believe, are still relative regulars when it comes to NWA and in and, 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 and there. So I can't see that happening. Second defense of the titles for El Fantasmo and Hikaleo since winning them last month. David Finley and Kenta against John Moxley in Wheeler, Utah. There are people out there that believe the person under the devil's mask is, is David Finley. Nah, it's not David Finley. I, I would think that it's Jungle Boy, but, you know, could it be Bullet Club? I guess it could be, since you got David Finley involved in stories, and you got him laying out United Empire's Osprey. You got him with Blackpool Combat Club's Moxley. It's a theory. It's possible. I just don't think it's probable. What is probable is TJP and Mystico going to have a kick-ass match, singles match with those two tonight. That's probably for, I think, a lot of people there. That that may be the match of the night. No offense against it with anybody else, especially Zack Sabre Jr. and Bailey, but TJP and Mystico is probably going to kick a whole lot of tail. Eight-man tag team match. The rest of Gorillas of Destiny, Tamatanga and Tangaloa team up with Kevin Knight and Kushida to face off against the Bullet Club. Alex Coughlin, Chase Owens, Clark Connors, Gabe Kidd. They should be the Bullet Club. No offense, David Finley. Bullet Club, Coughlin, Owens, Connors, and leader. Gabe Kidd. It's going to happen one day. Toriano against Joey Janela. Plunder. I, I predict Plunder being involved. And Atlantis, who I heard is making fast friends with filthy Tom Lawler. Atlantis is going to be teaming up with uh, Mascarada Dorada, Tiger Mask, and they'll face off against Hesha Cero, Rocky Romero, and Ultimo Guerrero. So that's what's going to be taking place on the NJPW Strong Show. Saturday, New Japan's got a uh, show titled NJPW Anjo Rady Days in Anjo Aichi. Uh, no card has been announced for that show yet. I'm not even sure if that one's going to be on New Japan World, but the World Tag League is going to be coming up real soon. That begins on November 20th, and by the time we do this show again, I have a feeling we will know all of the teams. I believe they're going to be announcing that on Sunday night into Monday morning, but we will see... All Japan's Pro Wrestling, All Japan Pro Wrestling's Real World Tag League also starts up this weekend on Sunday at Korokan Hall in Tokyo. Put a bow on this thing when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. Back on the show, Mike Sempervivi here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. Another week has come to an end. I guess it hasn't really come to an end. Saturday is when it comes to an end. Your man, Jim Valley, is going to be with you. Wrestling Observer Live coming up 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Pacific tomorrow with Jim. Listen in to that. He was down at Dynamite this week, got his name mentioned on Dynamite, hanging out with his friend Tony Schiavone. So going to be fascinating to hear what he talks about on tomorrow's show. What is also a little fascinating to me because, I mean, look how much DDT talent has helped to build AEW, Takeshita, Omega, Ibushi, you would not know by watching AEW programming that Kenoshige Takeshita would be facing off against Chris Jericho coming up this Sunday at Sumo Hall for the DDT promotion. There has not been one mention of it, not a blip, not nothing. I don't know why that is, other than maybe not to upset New Japan. I have no clue. But Chris Jericho against Konosuke Takeshita is happening for DDT. It is going to be, I believe, the semi-main event behind the KOND Openweight title match between Chris Brooks and Yuke Ueno. So Hiromu Takahashi also on that card, facing off against Kazuki Harada. So definitely we'll have the results of that for you coming up. Sunday morning on the Wrestling News, which I always hope that you, you get a chance to check out at Wrestling News on uh, Facebook and Twitter. Please check that out as well as staying tuned right here to WrestlingObserver.com, uh, 
Wrestling Observer Radio and Wrestling Observer Live. It's been a long week, everybody. I'm ready for this thing to end. There is football that needs to be played that I need to watch. Yes, I will be watching the wrestling too, but I need to balance that out. Football is my catharsis on the weekend. I need it to happen. I need ridiculous drama because i got to be honest, the drama that is taking place right now in the Big Ten with Michigan and with Iowa and everybody complaining about signals being stolen and did Iowa steal signals and why doesn't anybody care about the signals that were stolen and the plays that were given away by Wake Forest back in the day, all this stuff college football that real world somehow faker than the fake world professional wrestling but for everybody listening i would just want to thank you for joining me today thank you producer daniel thank you producer john i shall talk to you again after a while